Hi, this is Jade Shield, director of Cursed Films, streaming on Shudder, and you're listening to The Graveyard Show. Welcome to The Graveyard. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. Surprise. (laughs) Now, for those of you that are just listening to the show for the first time, you're probably like, huh, what? What is this all about? Um, But for those of you that have been following the show and listening to the show since I relaunched it last year, um, you will notice that this is actually going to be the very first original, updated, and current interview I've done since relaunching the podcast back in 2019. When I relaunched the podcast, the whole point of it was to start uploading interviews that were not available anywhere on the internet. It was just something I wanted to do because I'm I'm very proud of what I've done on the program and there are some great interviews on here and great guests. And when the website went away a long time ago, uh, all the shows that were on there went away with it and all the links that went to the podcasting sites went away as well. So you couldn't find the show anywhere unless you owned it or downloaded it yourself. Um, So um, about a year or so ago, I started getting the bug. Um, uh, It was one of those things that was just inevitable, I guess. Start reliving this stuff, you start hearing the interviews, the, the fun that I had interviewing the guests, just the fun I had uh, putting the show together. So um, about a year ago, I started thinking about, well, if I were to start doing original interviews again, what would that mean for me? And one of the things that I did not want to do was go back to a weekly podcast, uh, which the Graveyard Show was. It was Thursday nights, midnight Eastern, 9 p.m. Pacific. See, I say that like I, like I just did this. Um, but it was so ingrained in my head and it took a toll. It's a lot putting a podcast together. takes a lot of time, a lot of effort. And I just, you know, this is supposed to be fun and for fun. What I plan on doing is, um, which I've been doing is just kind of uploading shows on my own time schedule. Um, but now with original interviews, I'm not going to be as, um, there's not going to be as much downtime in between shows. Um, So I'm thinking maybe once every three weeks, maybe two podcasts a month, just depends on where I'm at, what I'm doing. So um, the plan is, is to start doing original interviews from here on out. And I'm really thrilled to have the man you heard at the top of the show, Jay Cheel, uh, director and editor of uh, Cursed Films. Um, So while I'm going to be featuring original interviews, um, I'm also going to uh, take a look back uh, at some of the moments from the, uh, or version one, as I call it, of the program. So uh, there will be some times where I may um, uh, feature some uh, takes that I had or some fun moments from uh, an older show or maybe share with you maybe some of the old uh, promos that we did for the Horror Podcasting Network, which lasted for a little while back in 2009. Uh, Maybe some old uh, show promos from other different horror stuff or maybe my own uh, uh, promos. We'll see. Um, But I'm calling it the Graveyard Show Flashback. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, the Graveyard Show flashback. Flash, 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 flash. <laughs> okay, I guess every time I say flashback, flash, 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 flash. that's going to happen. Okay, well, I'm not going to say that anymore. So anyway, so uh, that's part of the plan. And then I'm also on occasion going to upload some old interviews and use those as the uh, interview for that particular podcast. So just trying to uh, stay current now. And um, I couldn't think of a better way than to have Jay on the program to start things off as my first interview in, uh, well, over a decade. If you want to reach out to the program, uh, one way in, one way out of the Graveyard Show. And uh, that's through that gate that you just came in and you will leave later. And if you want to get in touch with the program, you can do so by emailing the program. It's gyspodcast at gmail.com. gyspodcast at gmail.com. That's G as in grave, Y as in yard, S as in show. gyspodcast at gmail.com. And uh, uh, if you have any suggestions, if you know anyone uh, that's an independent filmmaker looking for some promotion, uh, send it my way. Uh, As far as the interviews go, I did put out uh, some requests and uh, I have gotten all uh, positives back. So I'm starting to put together uh, a list of people that I will be interviewing relatively soon. And I already have October lined up, it looks like. Um, Someone that um, 
that I was um, uh, looking at interviewing uh, now around this time um, because of this person's schedule they weren't able to do an interview now so they asked if we could move it to October so I will revisit in October and as you hear in the background ah, it's music to my ears my old friends the grave diggers are back and they couldn't wait to get back to work because when you hear them in the background it means only one thing they are getting a grave together from my guest who has arrived so enough of me just blabbering on here it's time to get to work Cursed Films is a five-part series that examines the myths and legends behind some of Hollywood's notorious cursed films, such as The Exorcist, The Omen, Poltergeist, The Crow, and Twilight Zone, the movie. It's currently streaming on Shudder, and on August 18th, it will be available on digital, DVD, and Blu-ray. Jay Cheel is the director and editor of the series, and he is kind enough to join me in the graveyard. Jay, it is great to have you here in the graveyard. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be in the graveyard. Well, it's great to have you here. Thank you for taking the time to uh, talk to me regarding uh, your great series. Uh, I'm just going to cut right to the chase. Uh, What inspired you to create the series Cursed Films? Well, uh, the the series was actually brought to me by Shudder. So they were talking about the idea of doing a show about this concept. And they approached me because I I think because I had done this... um, short documentary uh, not long before called Twisted which was about a an urban legend surrounding my local drive-in theater uh, in which a tornado apparently ripped through a screen that was playing the movie Twister so I, I did a short documentary about that and just how everyone around here knew someone who saw it happen and and explored you know ultimately where what the truth was uh, behind that, but it ended up becoming a short film about the nature of memory. So that was almost an unintentional proof of concept for this version of Cursed Films that I ended up pitching back to Shudder, which was, you know, approaching it from this perspective of exploring the tension between the rational and irrational, you know, and uh, having fun going through all of the, cursed stories connected to the films but then stepping back and analyzing why we're so fascinated by those stories in the first place well i noticed by your credits um you do come from a documentary background uh was that something that you were always interested in or was it something that when you started working in the entertainment business you started doing documentaries and then that just kind of turned into your professional path I've always been interested in documentaries, but I've also always been a genre fan. So it's kind of a weird mix. Um, Documentaries for me, like creatively, I I think they offer some pretty unique challenges uh, that I just really enjoy trying to overcome. Um, And I, I, I think in terms of my, my interests as a filmmaker, they, they certainly don't, stop at documentary I, I'm I'm definitely interested in getting into the uh, the scripted zone and, and doing some genre films including horror films um, but I do have a, a love of documentary and with the series that that was kind of uh, you know the hope that I could create something that didn't just feel like you know like a, a video version of an internet listicle or a, a a DVD bonus feature or something like something that, that, that actually feels like a doc, a proper documentary series and approaching the material with that sort of intent. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm a huge documentary fan, both making and watching. Sure. Well, I have uh, four cursed films. You acted as, uh, of course the director of the series, but you also acted as the editor as well. And I'm Mm -hmm. wondering, how does that alter your thinking when you're doing the dual roles versus if you were just an editor, quote unquote, or just the director? Well, I mean, it's it's certainly something that isn't always recommended. I I think usually people, the, the, the feeling is that you should kind of have another creative voice in the mix to, uh, help you separate yourself from the material and that that makes sense um with with these projects i think with documentary in particular it's just such an intimate form uh that that 
I've always just felt like, you know, editing is, is really an extension of the writing process when it comes to documentary filmmaking. And, and I would never say that by cutting my own work, I'm, I, I, you know, I couldn't find someone, some collaborator that could probably do, uh, uh, you know, if not a much better job than me, then at least work as a, a great partner in trying to find some common voice in a, a film. I, I do feel that it's helpful when I'm in the field and I'm, I'm ultimately thinking about things from both the perspective of a, a director and an editor and being able to be, uh, you know, very sort of uh, aware of what we need and what we don't need. And, and when I do end up getting into the cutting room, that, that also pays off because it's, it's a lot of the, the show is sort of predetermined in a way, even though there's a lot of discovery that, that's, you know, that takes place in the, the editing process. Um, the one big downside is when you're having creative conversations, if you're, you know, as you do, you know, talking about notes or something, you're by cutting your own show, you're, you're kind of distilling two potential voices down to one. So uh, I'm I'm always having to speak on behalf of the director and editor. And um, that's, that's a challenge. But I'm also just I love editing, you know, that's, that's a big part of it. too. I love doing it. So, so, you know, there, there are definitely cases to be made against it. But I, I guess sometimes I pursue it against my better judgment. <laughs> I was going to say, you probably, you know, you're talking to yourself, but it's, it's done professionally. <laughs> you're having battles between the, yeah. yourself as the director and yourself as the editor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I'd like to think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of um, humble enough or open enough to consider, like, I love notes, you know, like notes that are, mm-hmm. I, I don't like bad notes, <laughs> but and that's where it gets subjective. Like, what is a bad note? But anything that challenges a decision I've made in a way that makes me have to articulate a choice, and by our, by being able to articulate it, then it gives me confidence about that choice and makes me feel better about it. But if I can't explain why I made a certain decision, then ultimately you have to think about that and, you know, try to figure out why that isn't working and it it might be a matter of removing that decision altogether or it might be something that comes you know 10 minutes before that moment that ultimately is not allowing it to land so it's it's a fun exercise yeah and i'm sure too again i mean with your editing background as you're directing like you had mentioned you know you start i'm sure as you were doing these interviews the wheels are turning in your head while you're listening to them and i'm sure you're probably coming up with visuals in your in your head as you're hearing these stories and Mm -hmm. and i'm sure too for you it was it's it's it was much easier going, Oh, well I can cut to this. I can use this here. I need coverage of this. We need to worry about that. As opposed to you having that idea as, as, as the director and then going to an editor and then having to explain all of it, I'm sure it's, there's a much easier shorthand for yourself as well, putting this together and, and probably maybe even faster for you to edit these and get these episodes done quicker than if it were two of you. Yeah, for sure. And you know, we, shoot with a very lean crew and we 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 get a lot of material when we're out there but it's very strategic so and when you you only have certain amounts of time with some of these subjects and you know to to be able to really zero in on what what i feel that i need uh, i think it's just that much more helpful to be thinking of it from that that sort of editor's perspective. Um, now, getting to the series itself, uh, how was it decided, and who decided how many films would be featured in this in this season? And then, as far as the length of each episode, how was that determined? So the length was predetermined by uh, Shutter, and we we had a long list of movies that we were considering for the this first season, and I, I kind of looked at them and uh, you know was trying to figure out best five it actually started as a three episode show with two films per episode oh okay um so after after our first block of filming we realized that that just wasn't enough time for each story so we we ultimately ultimately ended up with five um and a half hour per episode and the films that were chosen were kind of picked 
in a way that, you know, with consider, considering that they wouldn't be too repetitive, that the, the mm-hmm. cursed stories connected to them weren't too similar, um, and that the people that we would be talking to would be a nice variety of voices. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, I think that worked. There is a, an arc to the series, um, which, you know, just gets kind of darker and darker yeah. and and starts to set the idea of a supernatural um, curse aside as we start to realize that, you know, these tragedies, there, there were a lot of um, just mistakes made on sets. And in many cases, the, these were avoidable situations. Um, and ultimately, it just shined a light on, you know, the, the people that were involved in, and, you know, we contextualize these stories by allowing those real people to talk openly and honestly about those experiences. Yes, as if you were looking at my notes here, <laughs> um, because that, that was one of the things going back and, 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 and watching these. Um, I had a different perspective the second time around um, versus the first time because they were being released one after the other after the other. Or I can't remember. I think they were like two or one, like a couple of days on Shutter until the mm-hmm. five were out. And in watching them in, in the order, um, I, there was definitely a tone I noticed. And um, I will... I will hit on that a little bit later. I wanted to start with, um, well, I wanted to move on to, I should say, to the the actual episodes themselves. And I I really do uh, like the way that you laid them out because obviously the first one, or well, one of the, the first one could have been either one. It could have been the Omen or the Exorcist. You went with the Exorcist. Um, Maybe. I will say actually that that order was not the proper order. So they, they. Really? They prom- yeah, they premiered the film The Exorcist on Shudder, uh, which happened to align with the premiere of our show. So they wanted to put The Exorcist episode first gotcha. so that it would release with the movie. Gotcha. And that one was actually intended to be, a, I believe, a third episode. Okay. Um, so it did kind of, you know, drop people in, into the deep end a little bit, yeah. I think, right out of the gate. Yeah. Um, before we could kind of establish the not just the idea of a cursed film, but also the tone of the series, the, our perspective and, and, you know, when we're being playful and when we're being, you know, a little more, um, I guess, uh, delicate with certain subjects and, you know, the, the blue, I, the Blu-ray that's coming out has the proper, uh, the proper order of the episode. So I do feel like it, gotcha. it you know, ultimately not, not extremely detrimental to the series, yep. but watching them in the, the proper order at least gives you a bit more of a sense of that arc and eases you in to, uh, you know, sitting down with a supposed real life exorcist yeah. performing exorcisms. How did you end up finding the exorcists uh, that you featured in, in the episode? I mean, we found him like you would find all exorcists, which is on the internet. (laughs) Um, (laughs) He's obviously not a, you know, a a church sanctioned exorcist, but the the point of that sequence was, was sort of to um, just, you know, uh, uh, discuss the legacy of the film and this idea of a horror movie um, working as like a, a, a missionary tool, which, Hector Avalos discusses in that episode uh, a demonstration of the existence of good and evil and you know that message bleeding out into the zeitgeist and you know people suddenly be being aware of the term exorcism and how that sort of uh, 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 affected the the people who saw the film and kind of um, ultimately ended up with this this idea that you know if you're having some sort of um in the case of the people that we talked to you know it was drug addiction gender confusion uh, lots of issues that are you know definitely not things that i think are best uh solved or or at least um you know counseled by an, an ex furniture salesman now <laughs> okay. at yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it, it was a little bit of a demonstration of that, and it certainly intended to be um, a skeptical perspective. And I think it also 
kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of Linda Blair emerging from that experience as, you know, a 13 year old girl who was looked at as the embodiment of evil you yeah. know, after her experience on the film. Um, it, it's just another way in which these stories that we're so fascinated by on, on the screen end up subtly, um, you know, interfacing with our real lives. And for some reason that's, that's exciting for for horror fans and i think ultimately it's because it acknowledges for us this idea that we we don't understand everything and you know there are many unknowable and unanswerable questions in the universe that these films attempt to shine a light on and when we see that reflected back into our reality that's that that might suggest subconsciously that there's something beyond this realm, I suppose, even if we don't truly believe that. Now she's gone on. Um, she's a, a animal rights activist, um, and yeah, uh, she's kind of she's kind of stepped away from the limelight, really. Um, although I don't know if she's <laughs> ever really in the limelight intentionally. Um, I, I always found her as being one of those stars that just kind of had a quiet career after a major success, and just kind of did her thing. Yeah. Um, there was something though she would not talk to you about. You had asked her regarding, I believe it was about having bodyguards and security. Yep. She wouldn't mm-hmm. talk about that. I, it was something I'd never heard about, or I'd ne- I'd, I was not aware of that. Um, what was it that you discovered that she, the reason or the reason you thought she might have needed the bodyguards? Or was it just something that you came across and said, oh, I'll just ask her why she had to have them? No, there, there had been some writing about that. And I think she might have talked about that once or twice. Um, in the media at some point, but part of it was, was this idea that, you know, she emerged from this film as this sort of representation of the devil. Um, and there were just concerns about her safety. And I, I think also just being a younger, a younger star is probably an el- there's probably an element of that as well, but the studio, the studio, studio, brought those guards on and I mean you see an interview in the actual show where there's reporters talking to her and asking her if she's been psychologically damaged by having taken part in this film so this it was like just such a I guess it's a um, it's because of how successful the film was in in demonstrating this this sort of reality um, that William Friedkin Uh, created of this little girl, you know, going through this unusual experience. And it it just shook people so much that the distinction between the film and and what's real, I guess, became a little bit blurred. Um, So, you know, like like anything, there will be some some unhinged people that I think come out of the woodworks and start to... um, make threats even if they're they're not to be taken totally seriously especially with a film dealing with the devil you know with all of the religious undertones well uh let's move on to the uh second episode through shutters uh, streaming um order uh the omen Mm -hmm. speaking of the devil and um so a lot of insane things happened during the making of this movie or even maybe even I think before they were during pre-production uh, with uh, airplanes being hit by lightning twice and uh, other airline uh, accidents you were able though to get uh, Richard Donner the director of the movie who I think is is probably one of the most underrated directors uh, not only of his time but maybe just in the, in the in cinema period one of the things that he brought up which uh, a few of the other uh, interviewees in the uh, uh, episode brought up they didn't think that the movie was cursed they actually thought that the film was being blessed and I'm curious what your thoughts were when you heard them say that well I mean they they always said it in this sort of playful way which you know, generally across the series, I, I kind of allowed the, the interview subjects to dictate the tone of the episodes. And Mace Neufeld and, and Richard Donner were certainly more playful than not when talking about all of the things that happened on the during the making of the film. 
and that was i mean their their sort of perspective was more of a you know it was blessed for us because it made a lot of money it was a huge success it actually saved the studio um because fox was having troubles at the time and everyone always talks about the omen coming out and actually saving fox in order for star wars to eventually be made um so you know it was very much a a blessed production for them in terms of their careers but that was actually something that in the edit i i sort of uh realized that when i would talk to people about that film they always just kept mentioning how you know all of these these weird situations leading up to and throughout the production of the movie were often situations where cast and crew were were missing uh disasters mm-hmm. you know like they were not getting on the planes that were crashing or not being at the restaurants that were being bombed and so it it gave this perspective of you know they they were blessed because it seemed like the devil was was ultimately uh targeting other people or 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 you know influencing them to leave certain situations in which they might be in danger so it just felt like a really nice twist on the whole curse idea yes. uh, for that particular episode and kind of an ironic one um that that was teed up by Richard Donner and Mace Newfeld for sure yeah and i love how that episode uh, you have the discussion of patterns and seeing patterns and things um, mm-hmm. My favorite, it might be my favorite in the whole series, is the um, basketball sequence. And I don't want to give it away for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Um, mm-hmm. I failed the test. <laughs> I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair when I saw what it, sh- you know, what the reveal was. And I was like, huh? <laughs> but <laughs> it was so awesome because it, it is, like you just said, it is one of those things where you talk about. Uh, cursed versus you know all the horror films that weren't cursed or you know you even showed instances of um heath ledger from dark knight and uh, Mm -hmm. a a clip from dark knight rises both you know obviously both films had had tragedies uh, happen but people don't talk about that and go oh the dark knight trilogy that was cursed um so so that's very interesting and i like that you that you followed that path because it is it's one of those things where you just kind of look at it and you go oh well it's a horror movie and something bad happened oh it's cursed especially if you have the devil involved or 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 witches or something that's supernatural it's just like oh well you know spirits up well they were playing with fire and look what happened right right yeah i mean it's uh even more so when the curses mirror the things that happen in the film you know the plot of the film uh i think that's that provides like you know with the the short documentary i was mentioning if a tornado rips through a screen and you know look who's talking is playing then that's not a story but if twister is playing then of course that's that's a a new sort of amazing uh, ironic twist to that event and i think that's uh, it's similar with some of the films we're talking about certainly the with the crow, the accident on set, weirdly mirroring uh, a scene in Bruce Lee's Game of Death, or the use of real skeletons on Poltergeist, mirroring the plot of the film with you know the idea of this subdivision being built on a burial ground. So I, I think those those patterns and those connections just ultimately give these stories that much longer a shelf life and and make them that much more fun to retell as well yes and as we move into episode three on the shutter uh, site uh, which is uh, poltergeist um, we do start moving into and this goes back to what we were talking about at the top um, where we start going from like sort of stories and all these kind of fantastic tales that are being told uh, we start moving into the world of reality um, with the deaths of Heather O'Rourke and Dominique Dunn, both you know, tragically dying. Uh, Heather at a very young age uh, from um, obstruction uh, in her intestines, mm-hmm. and then Dominique, of course, uh, being murdered. Um, I'm wondering uh, now: is that was that is that also the third episode in the Blu-ray release? No, that's actually the first episode. It is okay. Yeah. If you watch it, if you watch it thinking about that, you'll recognize that at the top there's a lot of general discussion about films being cursed and you know remembering movies being cursed and and I, I think that episode 
just kind of nicely um it covers a lot of of you know that that curse of, of poltergeist is a there are so many examples different examples uh connected to those films and there are tragic ones but then there's also the the idea of this you know mirroring of the plot which i mentioned and this idea of magical thinking yeah. so it, it it kind of gets into like a, a catch-all of, of what we'll ultimately be investigating uh, throughout the rest of the series. Yeah, and you, you also got, yeah, you get into the whole idea of the uh, evil being transferred through objects. Yeah, yeah. Which is very interesting, especially the one discussion of, okay, Hitler's jacket, who wants to put it on? You know, and people are just yeah. like, no, no, do not want to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's that weird tension between the rational and irrational because when you see in the Omen episode someone doing a, a ritual to curse a film or, or people seeking out an exorcist to resolve whatever issues they're going through, it, it looks insane, but we all engage in this, in, you know, forms of magical thinking throughout our lives, you know, whether it's holding on to a a family heirloom or like a, a sweater of a past loved one mm-hmm. or, you know, the Hitler's jacket example that I think that's a very, uh, you know, Ted Bundy's sweater. <laughs> like mm-hmm. there, I think there are a lot of people who just would not want to wear Ted Bundy's sweater. <laughs> uh, there's actually a scene that was, that was deleted from, from, uh, the show, but Matt Gorley, who's one of the, the people I interviewed, he, has a guitar that he bought and he actually discovered that it was previously owned by David Koresh, the Waco cult yeah. leader. And, um, you know, just the feeling, that weird feeling of that being David Koresh's guitar creates this weird vibe. Um, and you know, that's coming from someone who is not, a, a believer in, in the supernatural. So, we're, we're all yeah. affected by it. Yeah, and, and you know, it's kind of it's it just actually reminded me something that I f- forgot to mention when we were talking about Exorcist, um, because it's weird when I did my podcast originally from uh, 2009 and 2010, the I did about 75 podcasts, and I had one issue with one podcast when it went up online, and I can't remember how I caught it. Um, but it, <laughs> ironically enough, the subject matter that was being discussed was a stage production of Legion. And it was one of those things where it, it has like this sort of like a uh, static that appeared throughout the episode that had never happened before. And they're sort of like right. almost, it almost, there's something that kind of sounds like talking under stat. Like it's just, it's just bizarre. And I, and I, and the following episode, I did a whole thing about it, uh, at the end of my show. And as I started to talk about it, all of a sudden in the room, there's noises starting to happen. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, what is going on? And it's one of those things where I go, look, I, I'm just putting it out there. You all can figure out and determine what you think it is. <laughs> but right, I'm right. one of those people where I'm like, and I think I even said, I'll have to play it for the listeners after the interview. But um, yeah, it was one of those things where I'm like, I don't think I'm ever going to do a show about The Exorcist ever again. <laughs> Well, I mean, I can say when when we were doing those exorcisms during one of them, uh, Vincent stood up and and put his hand on one of the the people's heads and and one of our lights started blinking. Oh, geez. Which had never happened before. And you can actually see it in the show. It's like a bluish light that just started going on and off. Oh, man. And uh, (laughs) as soon as the exorcism was done, it just reset to an on position and that never happened with that light on that shoot. So it was very weird. Jay, I would have been down the street if I was on that set. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'd have been like, I'll finish from back here guys. (laughs) I'm good. (laughs) Yeah. It was strange. Yeah. It's, it's really some, some of that stuff I go, you know what? Maybe it's coincidental. I don't know, but I, 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 maybe it's just from my Catholic upbringing and and from having watched way too many horror movies. But there are just certain doors that when they open, I'm just gonna be like, no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't need to look inside. I don't need to push my luck. I don't need to say that what you know. 
Uh, I mean, I guess that's why horror films are great because you can just watch other people opening those doors. Exactly. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, really quickly, um, the last two episodes on on on, on the site on the Shutter site uh, are The Crow and The Twilight Zone. Uh, really, I mean, now we start getting into kind of real world stuff and. Uh, certainly the deaths, what we talked, what you discussed in Poltergeist, uh, the deaths of Heather O'Rourke, Dominique Dunn, uh, obviously very tragic, not minimizing that at all. Uh, for me personally, when I see something like The uh, the Crow when I watched it and Twilight Zone the movie, both times when I watched them, uh, the heaviness that I felt watching these, and I think the reason was is because as I'm watching these, I'm seeing these as real tragic events that occurred while you're making something that's supposed to be fake and you're going in saying we're going to do a stunt everybody's going to be fine it's going to look fantastic or you know we're going to do an action sequence and it's like somebody going to work one morning and then all of a sudden by the end of the day they're no longer on this planet and um yeah it's really it, it it's so heavy um and and you you did such a great job presenting these uh, let's start with the crow. Uh, you uh, you have a comic book that's born from tragedy, and then the film itself um, has the tragic uh, uh, killing of, of Brandon Lee. You talk about the sideshow that occurred after Brandon's passing, and uh, how all these kind of crazy conspiracy theories and gossip columns are, are putting all this stuff up. Um, can you talk a little bit about those parallels that, that people were trying to, you know, make some sort of uh, sense of, of Brandon's death uh, to Bruce's death? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, the, the, the easiest answer is just that it's fodder for tabloid, tabloids to sell newspapers. Like, it, it just is the easy go-to to, to make that connection and, um put it on the cover of whatever magazine they're trying to sell but beyond that i mean <clears throat> i think it's just uh april wolf talks about this in the poltergeist episode just this idea of trying to make sense of of losing someone in an instant and what that means you know the, this idea that someone can be here and gone like that and especially in a way that is so seemingly avoidable. And I, I mean, I think that's where a lot of conspiracy theory comes from. It's, you know, when you talk about 9-11 truthers, they, I think deep down, and this is, you know, not an original idea, but deep down there's some psychological um, issue of not being able to comprehend how so few people could have caused so much death and destruction. So, in order to make sense of that, you have to apply some grander scheme to that, or, or else it, it just feels like you could be gone in an instant in the in, mm-hmm. same way. So I feel it's an extension of that, you know, just yeah. just the idea that the Brandon Lee was this, and Bruce Lee, they were both these larger-than-life uh, characters and these people that had everything going for them, and both of them died in ways that seemed avoidable. Um, so it, it's hard to wrap your head around that yeah. um, without, without trying to come up with some, some way to explain it beyond just, you know, someone left a, a dummy bullet in a, a barrel. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting because um, I remember, that's one of the things I remember, like it was yesterday. Um, it was right after, it was not, I think it was right after I moved to LA and um, it, it, it that held weight. I mean, that was one of those things where you're just like, man. And but when you hear about how it happened, um, it's one thing. But in your episode, you actually had demonstration of the dummy bullet of how it could have happened or how it might have happened. And seeing it and seeing the damage that it could do, that was utterly frightening. What was that like when you were shooting that sequence? I mean, it, it was shocking because he did it more than once. Like he was able to replicate that result more than once. Um, wow. So, yeah, I mean, it, it just suggested that one, that it's very important to follow all safety protocols on set, but also that just one little mistake like that, and whether it's a dummy bullet left in or like a 
a rock or whatever it, it might be, um, there's enough power in a blank to send that projectile out of the barrel uh, in a way that would ultimately be um, lethal. So it, it was, uh, yeah, it was, I had never really fully grasped how that happened. Like I, I didn't quite understand this idea of a dummy round and yeah. how it could have ended up in the, the gun. And, but, but the demonstration beyond just showing the, 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 uh, the, the, the sort of damage that that can cause also showed how easily that could happen. <laughs> like that someone yeah. could, um, could, uh, accidentally lodge something in a barrel and just one person forgets to look down that barrel and and that's a disaster waiting to happen well i know we're tight on time here so uh i'm just gonna skip right to uh twilight zone the movie uh since that's the last of the five uh one of the things um that or one of the people that you were able to interview uh for that episode was steven farber who was one of the uh, writers of the book outrageous conduct I didn't think that anybody even knew about that book. I had read about, I had read that book some 30 years ago, 25, 30 years ago. So I was curious, was that a book that you were uh, aware of before you did the episode or was that something that you came across uh, in your research? I was aware of the book before, but I hadn't read it. Um, I can't remember where I'd seen the book. I know a friend of mine who is a, a you know, collector of various things, bordering, bordering on hoarder, uh, he he had a copy of the, the hardcover, so he he lent it to me because it's a hard book to yes. find. Yes, it is. Uh, so I was lucky that he had it. But um, yeah, it was great to, to connect with with him and get this sort of you know well researched perspective on that event. Um, and the the book is worth checking out for sure. That book is one of my favorites. It is so well done and well researched that for anybody out there who is, has not read it and you're curious about uh, the whole onset incident, that's a book you should definitely read. Uh, you were able to get the production designer from the film, Richard Sawyer. He was obviously to this day still broken up uh, over everything um, yeah. when re recounting almost from the get go. Um, so when you have an interview like that, there were a couple of them. The director from The Crow was another one, uh, as well as the director from Poltergeist 3 that you had on. Um, these men were recounting these really emotional sequences. As a director yourself, as you're sitting there, and also the interviewer, um, when you have these intense moments like that, I know you're trying to also get you know, the answers and, and get the perspective from them. Uh, what is it like, though, when you start hitting these moments like that as a director when you're sitting there in the room with them how, how do you how do you handle that yourself uh i mean i guess I, I just handle it by giving them the space to tell the story in whatever way they feel comfortable telling it and you know if if there is a time where they feel like they they need to break and we can obviously do that um and i just kind of try to make sure that they're continually comfortable uh, which, which Richard was, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it's, I, I guess I, I have a lot of respect for these people and, and I'm thankful to them for trusting in us to tell their story and being willing to, um, you know, uh, be that open about things. Um, because it's a tough thing to talk about, especially, you know, when, when you're approaching someone 30 plus years after the fact for a show called Cursed Films, I'm sure some people are thinking like, what am I getting into here? But, but I'm, I'm glad that we were able to demonstrate to everyone that our intent was not to exploit these stories, but rather to attempt to provide context to these stories so that they aren't just pass around, you know, as this sort of weird curiosity um, that, you know, you can kind of get to know how it affected some of the people who were directly involved. Well, I can tell you right now, having sat through these twice, um, I feel like you, you've shown respect to everyone, uh, those that you're interviewing, the memories of those that, that, that are no longer here. Um, and I think 
it's like anything you're talking about really tough subject matter some cases not you know some cases is just sort of the fantastic so you can have fun with that stuff but i think everything was handled incredibly well um you know it, it really was a well done series um i also just as a little tag i love how you had lloyd kaufman on the twilight zone episode was showing him um uh, how trauma uh, takes takes their safety seriously and you've you know you see it over and over and not only just in the current uh filming that lloyd was doing but also some of the older footage as well um yeah and and that was a nice that was i thought it was a nice touch and he i think really lent a breath of fresh air to it because uh i can't remember exactly i was starting to write down and i just forgot it was like he said something like i'm not about i'm not about money uh i went to yell what do you say i went to yell but instead i i stayed in new york dropped acid he took acid and went to new york and started trauma yeah <laughs> yeah, like, yeah i mean he's just so awesome um, yeah, just very. I mean, it was definitely a little levity in that episode. Yes. In a, a, you know, a very kind of dark episode. But also, I, I think seeing Lloyd talking in that way, like he's he's funny and he's he's Lloyd. But then ultimately, by the end of the episode, him kind of seriously warning uh, people of the dangers of making movies and that this is a very dangerous profession. You have to take it seriously and. And that coming from someone who's doing an interview in drag on the yeah. film, um, I think there's something about that. So, yeah, he he really is. He he's awesome. Uh, really quickly, uh, congratulations! I, I I heard that uh, season two is is happening. Um, yes. So, is there any anything you can tell us regarding season two? Uh, the only thing I can say at this point is we are the episodes will be longer. So we're, we're aiming for like a TV hour, so oh, probably nice. like 45 minutes-ish. Great. And um, there's five episodes again, and the, the collection of films is a very kind of eclectic, uh, diverse selection that I'm very excited about, and the stories connected to them are great, and we're getting a lot of, um, lining up a lot of great interviews for this one. And it will take us outside of North America, which is exciting, so it's going to be more of an international perspective oh that's awesome oh that'd be great yeah well i can tell you right now i know i'm looking forward to it based on everything i've read on the reviews on shutter people are loving and have loved uh the series since it's uh since it's get-go so congratulations on that uh jay chiel he's the director he is the editor uh of cursed films you can catch it still on shutter still out there and uh august 18th available on digital dvd and blu-ray check it out if you haven't go support cursed films jay thank you so much for joining me here in the graveyard thanks for having me and as i put this interview to rest i would also like to let you know that there is a trailer for cursed films on youtube so if you don't have shutter and you're just learning about this series uh you can go to youtube and watch the trailer for cursed films uh, also, if you're checking out the show on my YouTube uh, channel, uh, I have a link to the Cursed Films trailer in the show notes just below. That was so awesome. It was so great to have Jay on the show. I really am a big fan of his series. And um, having done my first interview now <laughs> in 10 years, woo! All right, I got to tell you, I was a little amped up. So um, hopefully it didn't come across too blatantly <laughs> in the interview. Um, yeah, that was great. He's so awesome. And again, I want to thank not only Jay for doing this, I also want to thank uh, the ladies over at um, Katrina Juan PR, uh, Priscilla, and uh, I think Allie uh, was the one who uh, initially reached out to me as well. So I want to thank, uh, thank them as well for facilitating this and getting this together. It was, uh, it, this was a lot of fun, and I cannot wait to have Jay back on when he does season two of cursed films speaking of you heard me mention about a moment on my program where i had a cursed films moment so i'll take you back um on podcast number 62 i had brian amide on from wallcloth theater in chicago and they were uh they were putting a performance of the uh book legion which is the book sequel to the exorcist uh otherwise known as exorcist 3 really when you see it in the movies so uh, I had Brian on, and uh, it was the one and only time when I uploaded a podcast where I had an issue. And it was, as I 
told Jay it, during the interview, uh, there was kind of like a static and all kinds of stuff on there. Well, when I uh, addressed the issue, uh, the following podcast, number 63, uh, which I'm about to play for you, uh, as I start to lead into the incident, weird stuff started happening in the room. And I'm not talking about like levitation or anything. I'm just talking about like the room had a weird energy and all of a sudden I heard like this banging. Now in the clip you're about to hear, you hear me setting it up and you hear me kind of, um, you're going to hear like this, you're going to hear me pause and then you're going to hear like a little, I tried to goose the audio originally to make it a little louder cause it was a little bit off microphone. Um, I'm going to try to do it here. Uh, try to edit it a little bit better, but, um, you'll have to kind of listen for it. So, um, that's me setting up the incident. You can hear how freaked out I'm already beginning to get because <laughs> I'm a baby <laughs> when it comes to this stuff. Um, and, uh, and then I'm going to tee up, uh, on that clip. I tee up the previous podcast. It's a long rant. So I I've done you the favor <laughs> of not subjecting you to my insanity yet again. So I've, um, I've cut it down to a reasonable amount because it's just me rambling. And even I, who lived this moment, didn't even know what the hell I was talking about listening to, <laughs> listening to this, <laughs> listening to me recounting what's going on. So I've cut this down to make it a little bit more understandable. Ultimately what it is, is this, uh, I played it back. There's some static. There's all kinds of weird stuff. I play one of the clips on here. You'll hear it. Um, all right, here we go. In this graveyard show, flashback. Well, if you follow the show on Twitter, you received quite an interesting tweet last Wednesday. Uh, essentially, uh, well, it was quite, <laughs> Wednesday was quite an interesting day for yours truly here in the graveyard. Um, if you remember, the guests on that week were Corpse S. Chris from Horror Host Graveyard and Brian Ami Day from uh, Wild Cloth Theater. This concerns Brian, and it concerns his interview. So Brian was a last-minute add to the show. I mean, very last minute. I wanted to get somebody on from Wild Claw to talk about their production of Legion because I thought it was um, a great idea and uh, certainly unique. And, I mean, these guys do such a great job there. Uh, I figured, you know, i got to get them back on the show. Okay, so... So, if I sound a little freaked out, <laughs> I, I am... Uh, and you're going to find out why as I, as I'm doing this, I like, I'm hearing all kinds of noises around me and stuff. And it's, and it's just been, it's been this kind of week. I'm, I'm still a little, uh, I'm still a little rattled by what happened. Every show that I've done, uh, since, you know, I launched the graveyard show, uh, I do like a quality control check. I go through, I listen to the entire show, top to tail, everything. I want all of you out there to enjoy the show and, you know, I want it to sound professional. Well, last Wednesday, uh, I was up very, very early. I'm going through, listening to the show, listening to the interview with Brian, and all of a sudden, right about midway through Brian's interview, pink noise. Just out of nowhere. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, what's the big deal? Well, it might not be a big deal. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, tonight's podcast is number 63. Now, that's 63 of what we call original podcasts, not including the two best of. So right now, The Graveyard Show has done a total of 65 podcasts top to bottom, right? That's with the same hardware. That's with the same software. Haven't changed them, haven't upgraded. I've done nothing, okay? I look at the waveform and there is this block of pink noise just sitting there that came from nowhere. I've never had that problem on this show ever. It just freaked me out because, well, what was I talking about with Brian? Well, we were talking about Legion, the sequel to The Exorcist, about possession and evil spirits and out of nowhere comes pink noise in the middle of an interview so i go back to the file that has my voice with brian's voice with the wind loop and everything and i look at the source and i'm like well the source i mean the, the record must have must have gotten screwed up somehow that i missed it's clean nothing is there 
I went back to correct this and in the middle of correcting it, the program crashed. I wound up reopening the show. I noticed the whatever 40 minutes prior that I'd listened to, all of a sudden there's points on it that now contain pink noise for like three seconds. They weren't there a couple minutes before that. They weren't there an hour before that when I started listening to it. Where did it come from? And it's just so ironic that the one time that this happened, it happened when we were talking about The Exorcist. So this is how it sounded um, last week. Appreciate him taking uh, a few minutes to spend here on The Graveyard Show. theater.com you could spell it T-H-E-A that just freaks me out <laughs> um, yeah I mean it happened there it, ha- it wound up happening on a couple of portions of Chris's uh, piece earlier which was fine when I listened to it the first time um, I take stuff like this pretty seriously and I don't say that as an overreaction. I say that as fact. That's just who I am. I, I take this seriously because, uh, like I said earlier, it, it, it didn't happen on the previous 61 shows and we talked pretty much about everything, uh, except the exorcist actually on the show. I don't ever recall having a conversation with anybody about it. And like I wrote online last week, I am not planning on having a show about The Exorcist anytime soon. I believe when I hear the stories that weird things happened on that set, uh, I believe it. I believe it when I hear that weird things happened on the set of Poltergeist. I believe that stuff. Uh, This is something for Coast to Coast AM. Uh, I really wish I had the version uh, on Brian's uh, part that, that I found, but I don't unfortunately. I called Brian that morning and I left him a message and he called me back a few hours later and he's like, are you serious? I'm like, Brian, I am not kidding. Uh, This really did happen. Uh, And I thought that y'all would, well, I don't know, get a kick out of that. The irony, hmm? Now, for those of you that don't believe it and say, you know, it's probably a software issue. Yeah, it could have been. I'm certainly not going to sit here and say it's 100%. You know, it, it could not have been. But you can't tell me without any sort of uncertainty, without even just a little glimmer of belief, that this was just something that was coincidental. And the Twitter site. I have a feeling I might be having a couple more (laughs) people following me now. And I'm telling you, I didn't say this to get to for publicity, okay? I, I, I give you my word. Although it, although it is something out of out of a movie that we would be seeing, you know, where's the proof? I don't have the proof, man. I don't have it. But really, there were zombies outside. There was a vampire. I saw the wolf man. Uh, the Twitter site is twitter.com slash graveyard show. Twitter.com slash graveyard show. We, uh, we uh, post a few tweets every week telling you who's going to be on the show and which ghosts are currently haunting <laughs> the graveyard at any given time. And uh, have a great week out there, everybody. And, uh, well, as you exit the graveyard, <laughs> send, in, send in an exorcist, please. <laughs> I, need, I need help here. Don't go. Everybody just stay. We'll all just stay right here. It'll all be fine. It'll all be fine. Have a great week, my friends. And uh, as you exit the graveyard, <laughs> I'd like to remind you to please... Keep the gate open. I want all of these spirits (laughs) to get out. Oh, boy. Until next time. (laughs) Flashback. Well, (laughs) there you go. You could, could, I mean, I had to have some fun with it, right? So, um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. (laughs) It's kind of just kooky stuff that happens here sometimes. Um, And I broke my own rule. I talked about The Exorcist here today. So there you go. Um, Anyway, so again, uh, if you uh, want to get in touch with the show, it's uh, gyspodcast at gmail.com. gyspodcast at gmail.com is the email address. There's one way in and one way out of the graveyard. 
Um, and I'm a traditionalist that way. I like email, don't have a social media site for the website. So sorry, folks. Um, in the meantime, if you have anything you'd like to suggest, please uh, send it to me. If you would like to subscribe, please do so. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. All righty, my friends. Well, I hope you enjoyed the very first original interview that I've done in a decade. I don't feel a decade older, but unfortunately, I am. All right, my friends, I will see you back here soon. And as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.